Thank you for the opportunity to present some of the work we're doing with biomaterials down in Cape Town. Um, most of what I'll talk about is related to myocardial infarction therapy, but I'll also discuss some other stuff that we do with these PEG, uh, with these type, our type of biomaterial. So I'm sure for most of this audience I don't have to say this, but clearly uh, myocardial infarction-induced heart failure is a significant problem. Um, these costs as seen here, the social cost of 20, 40% mortality in one year. And this is, I think, this is from a few years back in the USA alone. The, the, the economic costs are staggering. And clearly, we need additional alternative therapies. Um, very briefly, in one slide, to try and encapsulate what we're targeting in, in, in myocardial infarction therapy for, for heart failure is trying to derange this situation, which happens in certain hearts that undergo a myocardial infarction, you get expansion of the infarct, and that can then go on to pathological remodeling. So the heart becomes spherical and um, unable to pump effectively. So how does that happen? It's clearly an unbelievably complex topic, but where we're looking at it in, in the first instance is at the biomechanics of, of what's happening. So it all really ties down to this simple formula that was developed by Laplace for cylinders long ago. And essentially, when you have a heart attack or myocardial infarction, you get both a volume overload, the heart gets stretched, and then, of course, where you have the infarction here, the tissue starts to thin. Okay, so and you can see from this formula here, you, the radius, if that increases, or even more dramatically, if the heart, start, the wall starts to thin, you get an increase in stress in the walls of the chamber. And that then results in dysregulation of matrix metalloproteinase activity, neurohormonal activation that's excessive, which then exacerbates the problem by increasing volume overload. So of course, there are many other aspects, but we're not going to go into those that tie into this, this progression to heart failure. But looking at the biomechanics and, and radius increases and in wall wall thinning, here is a, is a very sort of basic way that people have used. Um, this is a device, oh, what have I done now? <laughs> I think I pushed the wrong button. Yeah, that's ah, sorry. Okay, so this is a, a, a device, um, it's called the ACORN device. It's basically being developed for people who already have heart failure where it's to place around the heart to stop it getting even bigger. And this is a preclinical trial in sheep where they induced a myocardial infarction and said, okay, well, what if we just slip this sock, I think it's of Dacron, over the heart, can we limit progression towards heart failure? So essentially, if you think of the Laplace um, equation, they're saying, okay, we keep the radius small. And, and it's, it was very effective. Here you can see... This is a, a heart that was not enclosed in the sock. This is the infarcted area, and this is the, the heart that was enclosed in the sock. You can see it's smaller, and it's got the infarct has not expanded to the same extent. So this shows that biomechanics alone can influence the progression towards heart failure. But clearly, this is not something people would want to have done to them after having a heart attack, to have their chest opened and have a big sock shoved over their heart. So... This is where biomaterials come in and why people have interest in biomaterials is can we stop the wall thinning? That's another driving force towards um, progression towards heart failure. And so if we inject biomaterials, and when I talk about biomaterials here, there are many kinds of biomaterials. I'm talking about hydrogels. So in other words, something that will gel inside the heart so you can inject it into the wall, and simply by preserving thickness of the wall, reduce stress. Um, this is a study from, uh, I think it's uh, Guccione's group in, in California, in San Diego, I think. And here they had a finite element model of the heart. This is the infarcted heart, and you can see the red is high stress and blue low stress. So this is the remote regions of the heart, minimal stress. Here you see high stress at the infarct and then also substantial stress in the border zone, which is presumably involved in driving the expansion of the infarction. 
if you inject hydrogels, and they showed that this is uh, proportional to the amount you inject, you see this reduction in stress. It's shown here, this is a, a um, subtraction. Um, you can see that there's substantial reductions of stress in the border zone. So that was a finite element model analysis. It's, of course, a model. We need to actually have experimental data showing that delivery of biomaterials have promise in reducing stress and therefore potentially reducing progression to heart failure. Um, why biomaterials? Of course, biomaterials have this potential. You don't have to open the chest. You can deliver them with a catheter. There are many different types of catheters people have available that will allow you to remotely inject into the wall of the heart. Perhaps even more, well, that's very important, of course, for the patients, but even more important is that you can take, using biomaterials, you can have a multi-pronged approach. And that's very much our feeling down in Cape Town, that you can't just treat such a complex pathology using a, one single approach. And so you can deliver drugs, and by drugs I mean things like growth factors, though we don't discuss it today, uh, potentially microRNAs and silencing RNAs, and you can also deliver cells. And we'll, we'll briefly touch on that later. Okay, so that, that, that's the promise of biomaterials. What have people done? They've done a lot of stuff. Um, it's all quite varied work. It's sort of the, the people who do this kind of research fit into two fields, really. Uh, one says, okay, we'll use biological materials like fibrin, collagen, alginate. These have bioactivity, intrinsic bioactivity, so they could be useful on their own. Um, but those like us who sit with the synthetic material say you don't really know what's going on here. You have a very complex material that has a lot of other things and has different effects. It's difficult to tell what's happening. So we very much sit with the synthetic materials where you can engineer exactly what you want and control um, your out outcome to a great extent. So I just very briefly go over two of the sort of main papers that have come out in, uh, from other people in the field. This is the first paper looking at the effect of injecting fibrin, which is from Randall Lee's group in the States. And it's interesting, so they were injecting fibrin, and what they were actually doing in this paper, which is why this all started, people weren't actually thinking of, of the stress relief of the, of the hydrogels. They were thinking, can we improve engraftment of cells? Now, this is quite a while back, and people were still using myoblasts, which, of course, has now been shown in clinical trials to be a very bad idea. But they looked at injecting fibrin, myoblasts, or myoblasts in fibrin. And they were surprised to see that, actually, they got exactly the same reduction in FOX size due to the presence of the fibrin as they did with the myoblasts in fibrin. Um, so what was going on? Again, it's complicated because fibrin also generates, can stimulate angiogenesis which obviously can also be therapeutic for, for the heart. But in a follow-up paper, they saw this. So here is an infarcted heart without fibrin, and when they inject the fibrin, they preserve the wall thickness. So that was the, those are the first papers showing that injecting hydrogels does actually have an effect. Um, and now I show you alginate, which is extracted from seaweed. I show you this because this is... There's a clinical trial going on this, which we await with great interest. There's quite a large clinical trial, an international clinical trial, looking at the effect of injecting alginate. Um, this study was done in sheep, so it's a large animal model. And they took advantage of quite a neat thing, which is that they injected into the coronaries. But a, the heart tissue is leaky where, where the infarctions occurred, so the alginate leaked out of the out of the coronaries, and then that's how they got injection into the heart. And I don't even, I'm not going to go into detail here, but it was proportional to the amount they injected, the preservation of ejection fraction. And of course, increased scar thickness or preservation of wall thickness. So that's really the, the main, sort of the closest to the clinic. Um, and now I'll just shift to, to our, our biomaterial of choice. Um, which we were working on before we got involved in myocardial infarction, which is polyethylene glycol hydrogels. And these, this particular type of polyethylene glycol hydrogel was um, developed by collaborators of ours at uh, University of Lausanne, Jeff Hubble. And I'll just try and go through this as briefly as possible. Um, it's important that we kind of understand how it works. So you have a branched polyethylene or PEG monomer, and then at the ends of the, 
at the ends of the, the branches, we have this moiety that we attach chemically, which is a vinyl sulfone. And vinyl sulfones are able to very specifically form a covalent bond with sulfhydrals. They form a covalent bond at physiological pH, they generate no byproducts, and it's a very stable bond. And it's very specific. It only interacts with sulfhydrals. So you can see, I think, if you take a peptide and you put a cysteine at either end, you have sulfhydrals at either end, so now you've formed a bifunctional crosslinker. And if you get the ratios of these correct, you can then crosslink essentially up one gigantic molecule. That's what our hydrogels are. That's just essentially one molecule. Everything is coupled to itself. Okay, so by being able to do this with peptides, we can, of course, then introduce enzymatic cleavage sites into these peptides, which then means that these gels will break down due to cellular invasion. So as cells move into these gels, they'll cleave these peptides, breaking down the gel. Okay. And then you can also couple many other things, like bioactive peptides, cell signaling peptides, cell binding um, peptides. Okay, so this is the gel we've been working with for a while, and um, um, we decided to start moving into myocardial infarction. And so we thought, perversely as it is, we thought we'd go for not an enzymatically degradable gel, but a non-degradable gel, which we can quite easily create actually using diethylethreatol. Because we wanted to answer this question, which was from Randall Lee's group, which said an injectable polymer that is non-degradable may be needed for long-term beneficial effects on heart remodeling. And we thought that our PEG would be the best for that, because we can, of course, form a non-degradable um, gel. And also, PEGs are the most biocompatible uh, of, all the, of all the biomaterials. So we looked at a non-degradable format. And we established a uh, left anterior descending uh, full permanent occlusion in rat model. And then we injected pegs. And we looked at one and three months after injecting. So we can attach fluorescent labels onto our gel. And um, before injecting, and this you can see the gel was injected into the heart. This is the infarcted area here. And you can see the gel kind of in streaks, which is interesting. And you'll see later why that's interesting, forms sort of bridging the infarct and, in, and into the infarct. So the red stuff is the gel, and then the, the cardiomyocytes and surviving tissue is in here. So that was after four weeks. We could quite clearly see our gel, and it was nicely distributed. And we definitely had preserved scar thickness. So this is our saline injection control group. Um, here, when we've injected the polyethylene glycol, you can see we get a reduction in wall thickness at four weeks which then is essentially preserved. These aren't actually statistically significantly different, but that is. So we had preserved wall thickness and therefore, we assume, reduced stress. When we looked at echocardiography of our, of our um, implants, we didn't see an improvement in fractional shortening. But what we did see was this sort of about 30 to 40% reduction in the extent to which the heart had dilated in diastole. So actually, this is kind of equivalent to the drug lisinopril. Lisinopril has no effect on fractional shortening, but reduces dilation of the heart. And it's very effective in the clinic. So we were happy with that. But perhaps foolishly, we had gone out to three months. And we were the first people to actually look this far after injection. And we could see a hydrogel looks very similar. At three months, it was still present. But we still had a tendency to, towards preservation of wall thickness. So the gel was still present. We will get still preserving wall thickness. But any effect we'd had of reducing dilation of the heart down here in the blue was lost by three months. The hearts had now fully dilated. So it could be that simply we still had a volume overload and just the biomechanical stress had just overwhelmed the hydrogel. But we think it's probably also due to this. And you know you might say in hindsight it's obvious, but as I say again, this, was the most, this is the most biocompatible hydrogel. But you are injecting it into an incredibly inflammatory um, environment in the heart. And this is ED1 standing for macrophages. And you can see just a persistent inflammation at four weeks and still at three months. So we're sure that that probably wasn't good for the heart. So even though it's in the infarcted region, um, we think that that's 
definitely always going to play a role with non-degradable gels. So in answer to Randall Lee's question, we can say, yes, it can reduce wall thinning, but we think non-degradability is going to be a big issue with biomaterials. There's going to have to be substantial improvements in biomaterials. It may not even be possible, that, perhaps, to really avoid this kind of foreign body response. So from there, we said, OK, well, we'll stop with non-degradability. Let's look at our enzymatically degradable gels. And here it's just injected into a heart. You can see they form just as nicely as the non-degradable gels. But we have MMP-sensitive peptide crosslinkers. And I'll tell you about those later in the talk. But essentially, they're sensitive to a, this, this particular peptide here is sensitive to a wide range of MMPs. So again, we wanted to ask a question, because it's quite a mishmash of attempts in the literature. People are doing all sorts of things and injecting different volumes. And one of the things they do also is some people inject immediately after infarction. Some people inject four to seven days. And some people inject even later. So we thought, well, this is the more interesting time points, immediate or four to seven days, which is probably most useful in the clinic. What happens if we inject our gel immediately or if one, after one week? We use it's exactly the same model as I described earlier, but we just inject immediately and seven days afterwards, and we had this MMP sensitive peptide. So when we looked at fractional shortening with echocardiography, we saw if we injected immediately between the control and the polyethylene glycol, no improvement. If we injected in a delay, we saw quite a, a large improvement that's statistically significant against all groups. So it appeared that when we injected our gel in a delayed fashion after one week, we see improvement. And why was that? Well, in part, here is an immediate injected PEG gel after four weeks. There's no preservation, well, effectively no preservation of wall thickness. It's thinned. But here, if we inject after one week, we see preservation of wall thickness. So there's something different. When you, this, these are exactly the same gels. They just injected it immediate and after seven days. Why is that? Well, I think it's probably quite simple. When you look at the pattern of injection, so these are rats that we injected, let the gel gel, and then sacrifice them. So if you inject immediately after infarction, you get this, these thin streaks. If you inject after one week, you get what we call a blob. I mean, you get a large chunk of gel forming. The scale is the same on these. Um, I think that's probably a couple of hundred microns um, of gel with cells entrapped inside it. So what's actually going on? Well, before I tell you what I think is going on, and, and it's pretty obvious, but this has a dramatic effect on how long the gel persists in, in the rat. So if you inject immediately, you, ah, sorry, you get this patterning, and then the gel disappears. Over two weeks, it's gone. If you inject after one week, you get this kind of blob effect or, or bulk effect. And it really, there's no change in the amount of gel. So it's getting degraded much slower. So as I said, they're exactly the same gels. It can only simply be that one by injecting at that point, you've got a larger surface to area volume of gel, so it's allowing for more attack of cells. So they get degraded more rapidly. Um, I don't think it's due to the inflammation because there's still a very strong inflammatory response at one week in the, in the rat. Why do we get that difference in patterning? Well, it's probably just down to this. At, in the rat and dog and to a certain extent human, at about the seven day time point, all your cardiomyocytes have died, and you're essentially left with a bag of fluid with macrophages in it. So when you inject at the immediate time point, you're pushing it between all the cardiomyocyte bundles. So you get that streaking. When you inject after one week, you're essentially ejecting into a bag of fluid, and the gel can form this bulk. So that's why it happens. And when we look back in the literature, you can see in where other people have been. This is an immediate injection, I think, from Bob Langer's group. You see the streak, and there's the gel sitting there. This is, I think, uh, fibrin. You can see it forms a blob when they inject it one week. So why we see functional improvement is, in part, I think, simply down to the degradability, though we are not sure that that's the only reason, because, as, as I said, the non-degradable did, did allow for some improvement, not to the extent that the degradable. That could be just due to the inflammation, but we think it might be more than that. 
And so we have a finite element modeling um, project going on with uh, mechanical engineers in our department. They've established finite element models. This is very preliminary work, um, but these are the models they've looked at. And then by modeling in a very crass way where we have layers or bulk layer, they both reduce stress, but we see in the models there's a, a greater functional gain when we inject bulk. So we just still don't really understand exactly why that's happening, but that's what we see. Okay, so I'm gonna change tack a bit now because as I said, we don't believe that simply injecting gels is gonna be sufficient. So one of the areas we'd like to target is for controlled release of growth factors with our hydrogels, which is what we're working on now. And we wanted to tap into some work because we also work with angiogenesis. And we've, uh, we wanted to use some of the data that we've got from angiogenesis. So we're in the process of doing that. Um, and clearly, you know, therapeutic angiogenesis is going to be useful in MI. It can uh, balance the capillary density to the hypertrophy of the vessels and improve cell survival. So we, we've got a number of um, angiogenesis assays that we've established, which are not related to a hydrogel, but we're looking particularly at neovascularization of scaffolds. Here in a rat subcutaneous model, um, we have a sort of pump control delivery system where we take um, osmotic pumps that you can purchase from Alzit that can deliver a very defined volume every hour that allows us then, we have a porous polyurethane scaffold that's completely interconnected and we basically pump the growth factors into the inner um, the lumen of this tube so they then form a gradient coming out through this porous scaffold and then we can then quantify quite precisely the amount of vessels that grow into this new space. Um, so here you can see this is a corrosion cast, that's micro CT, of vessels diving. So this is from the outside, here you see the vessels diving into the porosity. So by using histology and slices, we can quantify an image analysis, we can quantify the number of vessels that grow in. Not surprisingly, when we pumping VEGF, and if you look at the short-term time point of 10 days, you can see as you move across from 0 to 15, 150 nanograms per day, 1,500 nanograms per day, you get increasing amounts of vessels forming. But what we notice is that 1,500 nanograms per day, we get a, a huge plexus of vessels that look unstable. And indeed, what was novel about this work is that we showed that when you stop pumping and then you come back four months later to see what vessels have persisted, you only get a persistent increase, and this is a quite substantial increase of about 50-60% of the number of vessels if you deliver a moderate dosage. These are unstable, so when you generate too much, you uh, deliver too much growth factor, the vessel's unstable and they start collapsing at about 30 days. I I'm not putting that data up, but we could quite clearly see that, that you suddenly get the spontaneous collapse of vessels at at um, 30 days. So this is a useful system for determining dosages, but of course not going to be useful for the heart. So in our movement towards the heart, in uh, general, we, we took advantage of the fact that heparin can bind growth factors. And this is our porous polyurethane, and then our polymer scientists can coat it in a covalent um, surface or skin of heparin. Okay, so, so now we have, we have discs, little uh, tiny discs that we can implant subcutaneously and we can bind growth factors. And the first combination we looked at is VEGF and PDGF. Um, and we saw, due to the differing affinity of VEGF and PDGF for heparin, that the VEGF comes off very rapidly um, in a few days from these discs and the PDGF is released very slowly and in small amounts in a controlled release over quite a long period of time. So we basically have this where the VEGF comes off first and then the PGGF comes off afterwards. So in that study, we did subcutaneous implants and um, again in the rat. And as you might expect at 10 days, when we were looking at 10 days, you could see, well, interestingly, we could see effect just simply of the heparin alone, which you think is due to growth factor entrapment from the wound uh, and protection of the growth factors. But then you see no real effect of binding PDGF, and the effect is all due to the VEGF. So you get quite large increases. I mean, if here you go from 2.5% <clears throat> total area 
up to almost 7%. So there's a substantial increase in the number of, of vessels due to the delivery of VEGF from these um, controlled release situations. If you go out to two months, the situation reverses. Um, and anybody who's clued up on angiogenesis will know this is slightly a unusual result. We actually see angiogenesis due to the presence of the PDGF. We did see mural investiture, but we don't really see, we didn't see in this study a strong mural cell recruitment due to the PDGF. We actually saw angiogenesis. And we think that we haven't proven it, that that's because we're delivering at such a slow rate, such a small amount of PDGF. The PDGF has been shown to stimulate at low levels release of VEGF from surrounding cells, which you then think gets entrapped and protected in, in the, the heparin surface. So again, this is a polyurethane scaffold, and we're actually doing this for, for vascular graft work. But now our most recent work is to try and translate this to something that we can inject into the heart. And so what we've done is quite simple, but it's, it's, what's nice about our hydrogels is without too complex um, chemistry, we can modify the heparin essentially by, this is what the polymer scientists call it, alpha B unsaturated functionality. I call it acrylate. It's a molecule that you can attach, which then allows the, the acrylate can bind to sulfhydrals. So we can then incorporate heparin into our hydrogels. And that it can then also, due to the chemistry, the heparin can also then be released um, un, un, in, its, in its virgin state. So we haven't got terribly far with the using the hydrogels. This, is, this has just been developed. But we do see uh, with another heparin binding growth factor, BFGF. We see a um, sustained release over 25 days from a, a non-gel. Uh, this gel obviously isn't degrading, but it's just slowly releasing growth factor. And uh, very limited bioactivity studies, but you can see that if we grow cells in the hydrogel, um, only if you have heparin and BFGF present, you get, you can, I hope you can see these the quite pronounced sprouting. If you don't have BFGF present or you don't have heparin present, the cells just sit there and don't sprout. Okay, so we're busy analyzing these now in our subcutaneous assay. Um, but there's another area that we think that our heparinized gels will be potentially useful in, and that's in adult stem cell therapy. We are certainly of the school that don't think that ad adult stem, stem cells as a therapeutic option is due to their cardiomyocyte differentiation, but more as, as our collaborator has shown, Max Necki, due to the paracrine effect, the production of, of large numbers of growth factors by these stem cells. And so you can see we're thinking uh, our heparin gel will be useful, and in two reasons. It will be retention and engraftment of the stem cells. So clinical trials have shown adult stem cells are safe, and they have a modest benefit, and it's a very modest benefit. And, of course, one of the theories is it's a modest benefit because as you inject the cells, they either get blown straight back out of the injection site, get washed away by the circulation, and you're injecting into an infarct. It's not a happy place for a cell to be. And um, that's my, perhaps one of the more dramatic figures, but up to 85% of, of cells can be gone within an hour of injection. So our gel could serve two purposes, is what we're working on now. We can couple cell binding sites onto our gel, RGD in this instance, which allow our cells to, to be happy and bound into the, um, into the gel. I must say, you'll see later, that the gel cell certainly can't just come out of the gel. The, 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 um, the gaps between the monomers in the nanometer range, so the cells are very much entrapped. But the RGD, if, to allow them to survive and, and, and thrive. And then having our heparin here perhaps can sustain the paracrine effect and also feed back to the stem cells. So uh, I had hoped to put another thing into this talk because I've just been in Pavia and, um, but never got to it. Uh, our collaborators there in Max Necki's lab have shown that indeed these hydrogels, if you put um, stem cells, human amniotic stem cells in hypoxia and look 24 hours later, there's a, there's a significant su increased survival from about 50% 
to in, in the presence of the hydrogel about 80%. So that's promising. And when we look at engraftment, this is just done in three, I think, three rats. Um, I think these are, these are human amniotic stem cells again. Um, this is when you, in, you inject without the gel and look one week later. And this is when you inject with the gel and look one week later. And if you overlay, you can see that's our gel um, sitting around the cells. So that's where we are now. We've got a, a study going on now. And uh, we have preliminary data showing that there is uh, an improvement in echo uh, in fractional shortening due to this combination, but it's a bit too early to be too conclusive about that. So while we are working on the heparinized hydrogels and fine-tuning them, there's a much simpler way in which we can deliver growth factors from, from our hydrogels, and that's simply to take a, a advantage of nanoparticle, microparticle, um, controlled release particles of growth factors. And this is in collaboration with Prof. Wang from Pittsburgh University, and they have um, particles that form spontaneously from a polycation, PAD, and heparin. So here you can see if you have the heparin, you add the PAD, you basically form milk. The coacivates, here they're labeled, and they're in the region of about 900, 800 nanometers. So very simply, if you form our gel in conjunction with these, those are going to be trapped inside. So it's a very simple way that we have of delivering growth factors. And so in this very recent um, work, which we've done in collaboration with Prof. Wang, um, they had this combination that they had shown is, is cardiomyocyte protective, which is sonic hedgehog and, and the anti-inflammatory interleukin-10. Sonic hedgehog obviously is proangiogenic. It also recruits stem cells. And so if we use the combination of that coacivate and our MMP degradable peg gel, and we basically did this where we injected immediately after infarction and then followed them out to four weeks. We label the heparin. The heparin is labeled fluorescently. So here you can see the particles entrapped inside the hydrogel. This is in vitro. And then you could see also when we did a small, small number of rats, you could see increased, quite a, a large increase in retention of, of the coacivates in the rat tissue after a day, after injection. So we certainly were improving the amount of retention of the coacivates. So we did a cardiac function study. Uh, we have these four groups, saline, gel, coacivate, gel plus coacivate. When you look at fractional shortening, so that's pre-infarction, uh, pre you can see these three groups all essentially are, are the same. There is no improvement due to gel or just coacivate. Um, but when you combine the two, you see a significant improvement in function that's persisting out to four weeks. Um, we're still analyzing this. We've done infarct size. We just didn't get uh, significance. So we do see that the gel plus coacivate did reduce the infarct size, but only P equals 0 0.07. Should have done a few more rats. Um, anyway, so at the present moment now, we're also looking to see for presence of CKIT cells and um, increased angiogenesis. So this is another way that we can use our hydrogel. So our hydrogel is a kind of platform that we can take a variety of means of targeting the heart. Um, now this we haven't deployed on myocardial infarction, but I thought I'd present it here because it's another thing we can do with our hydrogels. Any drug that has a hydroxyl in it can be coupled with relatively simple chemistry, so I'm told, to, to our hydrogel. And then, so for instance, this is dexamethasone uh, with quite a number of hydroxyls. It can be coupled there via an acrylate, which then can be hydrolytically released in a completely unmodified form. So the dexamethasone can be essentially pegylated, attached to our hydrogel, and then can be released unmodified. So this is in vitro work. So we, don't, we don't modify the, the DEX. Um, it comes out very rapidly out of our hydrogel. And these are slightly different chemistries. We can control the release rate of the dexamethasone. Um, and this is a slightly unusual study, which we did for a, a device company that funds us. They were interested in saying, well, could our dexamethasone 
gels perhaps reduce the amount of inflammatory response or, or cellular death that results after delivery of adenovirus. Um, so we essentially injected adenoviruses, quite a large amount, 10 to the 9 PFUs containing GFP. And this, so this is not correct. They weren't infarcted hearts. They were just um, standard hearts. And then either in the presence of our gel with or without dexamethasone attached. Um, and then looking for the number of cells that survive after one week. So we do see, we see if you inject, this is what we see if you inject with just our PEG gel and the GFP adenovirus, that's the amount of um, positive cells, and we see a substantial increase when we inject in the presence of the dexamethasone. Um, we, if you image analyze it, you can see there is a, a large increase, but we really saw this as a proof of concept that, that our dexamethasone did seem to be active. This is slightly misleading, though this is a big increase. We think we didn't rescue that many cells. There was still a substantial amount of information present. Um, so I would imagine if you went back again in 10 days or after, after two weeks, all those cells that we had rescued would also be gone. But it did seem to delay the process. So we're now looking at, at a drug called rapamycin, sirolimus, um, for targeting for MI to increase autophagy um, and that's what, where we're going with that. Um, and now for the final part of my talk, um, I'm going <coughs> to switch quite, quite, quite a lot. This is work that we haven't been doing for myocardial infarctions at all. This is more basic work looking at what happens if you modify all these various components. Can you influence cellular behavior and can you specifically influence different cells to behave differently? So what I'm saying is the cell interacts with the extracellular matrix. And that's essentially what our hydrogel is. It's an extracellular matrix mimic. It interacts through binding to cell binding peptides in the extracellular matrix via the integrins. It modifies its environment by degrading the extracellular matrix using MMPs and cleaving at MMP recognition sites. And so can we take our gel and by manipulating particularly this and this, can we influence how cells behave? So the very first time we did this, and it was published in Biomaterials and it was quite a long time ago now, we said, okay, well, in two dimensions, if we track the speed at which cells migrate on, on the surface of a PEG gel, that we then modify with different combinations of cell binding um, peptides. Can we influence how fast cells move? And we saw that we could. So if we took a combination of RGD and YIGSA, which is from laminin, compared to other combinations, we could see that microvascular endothelial cells, their speed increased by 25%, while smooth muscle cells were uninfluenced by that combination. So that was, I think, one of the first sort of um, studies with these types of biomaterials that showed by simply manipulating cell adhesion sites and combinations that you could influence cells selectively. But this was never of too much interest uh, to us because two dimensions is a bit limiting for cells and it's not really going to be much useful in vivo. So we wanted to see, and this is our most recent work, what happens if we start modifying the degradability of the gels to the various MMPs. So um, this is what we did. We formed gels using three different types of, of, of peptides, which one we called pan-MMP, one we called MMP14, and MMP9. These are recognition sites. These two down here are recognition sites from, from phage display libraries showing very strong specificity to MMP14 or MMP9. And then this one up here is the one we normally use, which is an engineered peptide that can be degraded by a wide range of MMPs. So we were interested in these for various reasons. MMP14, for anybody who, who follows this stuff, MMP14 is critical for cell invasion. invasion. In many endothelial cells invade fibrin. Many tumor cells use it um, to invade matrices and hydrogels. MMP9 we're interested in because most of the primary cells don't express MMP9. It's in, in, 
expressed by inflammatory cells and tumor cells. So we said, what happens if we form hydrogels using these different cross-linkers? But of course, before we could get there, we had to do quite a few controls. We had to modify the sequences to allow them to, to form our hydrogels by adding cysteines and various flanking. So we wanted to show that we preserved um, specificity. So we formed hydrogels using one of these three peptides and then exposed, in the first instance, to purified MMP9. You can see the pan MMP is that kind of hydrogel is rapidly degraded by MMP9. But then if we look at the specific ones, then MMP9 cross-link gels are degraded by MMP9, and the MMP14 gels are not degraded by MMP9. And if we flip it, MMP14, quite, not quite as dramatic as the MMP9, but you see again the pan MMP being cleaved very um, freely by MMP14, and now MMP14 peptide cross-linked gels being cleaved by MMP14 and MMP9 significantly less. So we preserve specificity, um, but before we could move on, we had to now also show, because the biomechanical characteristics of, of hydrogels are being shown more and more um, to very much influence cellular behavior, and we didn't want that to be playing a part. We really wanted it to just be due to the degradability. So you can determine the mesh size, the gap between the monomers, and as I said, it's in the range of about 25 nanometers, and they're identical for all three gel types. We can, using rheology, um, determine storage moduli and st essentially stiffness of the hydrogels. And again, we saw no significant difference between the, the three hydrogels. So at this point, uh, we knew we had gels that should only allow any difference in behavior, cellular behavior, be due to the specificity of the sequence that we cross-link with. So we developed a three-dimensional um, cellular invasion assay. Uh, we used these two cell types, dermal fibroblasts and smooth muscle cells. These are vascular smooth muscle cells. We formed 750-cell spheroids using one of those typical techniques, round-bottomed wells. And then we can embed those spheroids into our hydrogel and on, on a cover slip and then follow cellular invasion over a few days. And the way we do this is we kind of stop the experiment at three days, we stain with phylloidin, and we can see the cellular sprout. So that's the original spheroid, just blacked it out here. And then you can, using image analysis, uh, we use a package called VisioFarm, we can detect uh, cellular invasion. So before we could move on to actually looking at how the cells behave, we needed to show that it was due to MMP invasion, that the cells couldn't push their way into these gels through um, force or perhaps through some other protease. So using this inhibitor, GM6001, which is a pan inhibitor of almost all the MMPs, here you can see the spheroids sitting. This is fibroblasts, smooth muscle cells sitting in our three types of gels, and you can see quite clearly there's very little invasion occurring. So any invasion we see in the absence of GM6001 is due to MMP activity. So this is what we saw, and it's of some interest in the biomaterial field because it's a little bit unexpected, and we don't really know why. But if you look, so you look along the top here, fibroblasts, you put them in the pan MMP, you get this amount of, uh, of invasion. You go into the MMP14, it drops. You go to MMP9, and this wasn't, this wasn't unexpected to us because they don't really express MMP9, you get very little invasion. You go down to the SMCs, MMP9, it's the same. They also don't express MMP9, and there's very little invasion. If you look at the pan MMP, it's very similar. They're identical. If you go to the MMP14, you can see there's a dramatic difference. We repeated this experiment a number of times. We see this. We see a huge invasion of SMCs into MMP14 gels. We've quantified it in a variety of means, and you always see that pattern. So you see here, drop, drop, drop for the fibroblasts, statistically identical, and then this massive increase in MP14. At this moment, we don't know why that is. We had kind of, this is the reason we went for the MP14 sequence, because we knew that MP14 is a critical invasion enzyme. And we actually were kind of predicting all, that both cell types would do this. Because if you think about it, what our theory is that 
MP14 is expressed at the tip of an invading sprout. And perhaps by, we thought that by being more controlled and that you literally, when you're tunneling through something, you want to just be degrading the front of the tip. You don't want to be degrading the ground on which you're resting the back of the sprout. And so our theory is, but we, we still need to do experiments to show that, that, that perhaps the smooth muscle cells are focusing their MEP14 expression better, but we really don't know at the moment. And so we, we're going to look at sRNA and inhibition of the various enzymes. We want to look more closely at the tips. And we want to try and set up this assay which allows you to actually, uh, you, you have a basic FRET peptide, and so you can look at the amount of invasion, that, uh, the amount of degradation that's occurring at the tip and at the back of the um, sprout. And as I said, this is more of a proof of concept that you can use these gels to selectively influence cellular behavior, but perhaps in the future it might add another layer, for instance, in vascular grafts where you want to attract smooth muscle cells. You might have MP14 crosslinkers uh, and PDGFBB. And and the final thing is, so we also, th what we really want to look at now is since this recent paper from Jason Burdick's group showing that stem cells differentiate their differentiation from to various uh, uh, phenotypes in a 3D matrix is driven by what they call enzymatically controlled cell traction. And so we think that this system that we've got where we can really manipulate cellular degradation might be very interesting in this area, and that's where we're hoping to move. So thank you, and I hope that's just you, I've shown you that that's our approach, is we, we sort of have a platform, and we're very happy, which is part of the reason I'm here, I don't present that work, to, to look at different ways of using our hydrogel to attack pathology, the pathology of MI. Thank you very much.